Ladies and gentlemen, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Good start. I'd um, like to welcome you to our first post-COVID cemetery tour. It's been very exciting to be able to get back to the normal fall routine of the cemetery tour. Thank you, Mary Hansen, uh, Kathleen Cooling for putting together the scripts, and of course, thank you to Patty and the drama students from the St. Luna High School. Um, we're very excited to invite you over to the previous Catholic school property where we have finally, finally opened an exhibit space for the public. We're only open at this point on the first Saturday of the month, but um, any volunteers are welcome to staff and we hope to be open more frequently. The other thing is if you want a private tour for your book group or your ladies group or your gardening group or whatever, or even individually, we will try to accommodate that. We would love to have you come and see the collections that we've been housing at the upper floor of the library for the last 20 some years. Um, so we're really, really excited to be able to have us visible in the community at this point. And I'll turn it over to Miriam, who's going to do your tour and um, give you the background for today's program. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, to get us in the spirit, we are lucky to have Katie Hopgood Scalati with us, and she's going to sing a couple of numbers for us. Well, the first is the Italian national anthem. Has anyone heard this? Yeah, we heard you sing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm only going to sing the first verse and the chorus because there are many, many, many verses. So if you want to listen to it, I invite you to go to uh, YouTube and it's, it's quite the story. So um, just note that just like the national anthem for us, there's more to it than what we traditionally do. Okay. Fratelli d'Italia, l'Italia se dista, e l'elmo di Scipio si cinta la testa, dove la vittoria le porga la chioma che ci ava di Roma, e Dio to open with a Puccini piece, um, O Mio Bambino Caro, because it's just one of my favorites. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, when we are touring around, I just want you to feel the rich Italian heritage in our bones. And um, Puccini is it for me, you know, along with spaghetti. <laughs>
And it's appropriate because, you know, back, back in the day, uh, there were many children who didn't um, live very long. And so we have a lot of children's graves here. So, so let's get started. Follow me. I do. Thank you for being here. Who were you? I was, I don't even remember. I just remember it was with Josh, and I felt very weird standing on top of a grave. <laughs> I'm so busy photographing, I don't know what I'm walking on. I know. There are holes here, Kathy. I know. <laughs> anyone who has trouble standing. We have three chairs here in front. If you're, uh, if you're in need of a seat. There are three chairs here in front if anyone is in need of a seat. Okay. Okay. Okay, come closer so you can hear. Come closer, 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 closer. Good afternoon. Tina, you were the best big sister anyone could have. And I'm so happy we got to spend so many happy years together in San Marino. Yes, Ida. After Mother died in Kansas, you and Father moved here. And soon after, you met your wonderful husband, Anton Rossi. When your husband died in Kansas, you moved here with your little daughter and met your second husband in St. Helena. <laughs> St. Helena is a great place to find a good husband. <laughs> My aunt left his family in the Italian-speaking area of Switzerland as a poor boy, only 18 years old. He told me how hard he worked in New York for three years to save enough money to come to California by ship. We married a year after I came to St. Helena in 1879. I was only 18, and he was 27. Anton was a hard worker and great businessman, and very successful, too. True. When we met, Anton owned the Swiss Union Saloon and Boarding House on Main Street. They serve the best meals in town for the lowest price. You must have been happy after he sold that saloon when you two got married. Yes, Anton sold the saloon when we bought our 160-acre homestead up on Chapman Road. He planted 35 acres of grapes, and the rest of it was planted in grain, a small orchard, and pastures. It was a beautiful place, and a great place to raise your three boys, Fred, Luther, and Arthur. Our oldest, Fred, became postmaster in St. Helena. He and his wife are buried in the Catholic cemetery. Luther moved to San Jose to run a meat market and is buried in San Jose. Our youngest, Arthur, and his wife, Minnie, are buried here with us. Our father, who fought in the Civil War, is also buried here in the soldier's plot. Lucina, we were so fortunate to live long and happy lives with our families. <laughs> Life was good until the end. I was able to walk to town every day to do my shopping until I died at the age of 86 with my daughter by my side. I lived almost 40 years longer. After Anton died, I lived almost 40 years longer until I was 82. Anton's death was so sudden. Yes, the day he died, Anton drove down to town on business. And after returning home, we discussed the Mexican Revolution and read the newspaper. Just before midnight, I heard him make a gurgling noise and I tried to revive him with a glass of brandy but he died before the doctors or the neighbors could reach us. After Anton died, his brother Fred and his sister Angelina left Switzerland and came here near St. Helena. So today, there are many Rossi descendants here. He nurtured our family with kindness and we were both active in the Presbyterian Church throughout our marriage. And though he started with nothing, Anton built a vineyard and a winery with hard work. And as his business grew, he hired immigrants from Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. It was kind of Anton to give them a place to live on the ranch. It must have kept you busy. Yes, it was a busy time for everyone. 
Would you like some more tea? Please. Your winery was a beautiful two-story stone building that worked by gravity flow. And it was big. Its capacity was 35,000 gallons. Your winery still stands today on Topland Road, which houses Height Cellars. <laughs> At the entrance of Height Cellars is, is a stone with Anton Rossi's name on it. He was known in St. Helena as a kind, honest, and quiet man, and I think he would have been quite proud that his winery still stands and thrives. <laughs> My husband, Batista, was a smart businessman who quickly moved up to St. Helena. In 1878, he bought the William Tell Hotel in Spring Creek, enjoying the Napa Valley Strip Club. He has been most amazing. Only a year later, he moved the hotel back on the lot. They were convinced to bring building up the street. The hotel advertised room, 10 quick meals, and wine. Sumira, you must have been a club. I was, with my baby Katie and then a new baby, Severina. We needed help, so we invited nephew Felix Salamina to come to America and live with us. He became the new bartender. The latter is there to help with the next two babies, Maria and Batista, and to console you when you only found out that you were going to be married to. <sighs> my only son died, but I still had three daughters who needed me. My husband also had a stroke around the same time when he was only 52, so we leased out the, we leased out the hotel. Um, I had to help run the family business besides having four, five, and six-year-old girls to care for. We got the hotel back years later when the tenants left. I heard you were coming with for a visit in 1991. At last, I saw my family. Felix and Batista became partners in a new winery, F. Salamina & Co. They made their first wine near Rutherford and leased out Lucky Winery, which had a house. And we still ran the hotel. So you took and took care of children and daughters, also with the winery? We did, but in 1902, after 24 years, we quit the hotel and leased it out. The new winery took all of Batista's time. I helped with bookkeeping. Were you building a house at the same time? Our home at the corner of Swing and Oak Street was being built, and we moved in in the fall of 1902. We bought 35 new acres of vineyard. I'm so sad that you only lived in a new house for five years when your husband died. After he died, everything changed. I moved the children to Lugmead, and my daughter Katie became a widow, so there were 11 of us. Felix finished building the new stone winery there today. And then there was that terrible fire. The family's home burned down, so we got a new house with seven bedrooms. Finally, a home for all of us. We lived there as a happy family for many years. In 1943, we sold Lugmead, but kept the house next to it. We also sold the William Tell Hotel and the house next to that in 1944. I was with you in spirit in 1947, when a big dinner party was held at Pepper Farm Center in honor of your 90th birthday. What a great time you had with all the family. It was like a bon voyage party, because a year later, I was reunited with you, forever. Fine, so did you, Sabina. We had a good time. I'll say my favorite one. Mamma Mia, we are so alike. I wanted to make you proud after all we went through to give us kids the best life. Your father came to America in 1906 and worked in the Minnesota mine. He brought me there in 1908, and for 14 years I ran a boarding house, cooking and cleaning for 16 men, all while having four babies. You were so amazing, Mama, but both of you worked so hard to save money. I am glad you moved us to Lodi in 1922 because the weather was so much nicer. In that crazy time called Prohibition, my dear Caesar went into the grape shipping business. Italians could not live without wine, so they bought grapes and made their own all over America. I loved playing football at Lodi High School. I even made the MVP. I was so glad to scrape together enough money in Stan so I could attend Stanford. I even studied chemistry and winemaking in my last year. This was so helpful when your papa became a partner of Sunny St. Helena Winery in 1937 and you were able to help with winemaking chemistry. Prohibition ended in 1933, thank the Lord. So many people were ready to drink wine again. By 1943, well, yeah, we were doing well and Old Charles Crew Winery was up for sale. I urged Papa to buy it. So your Papa and I were still in Lodi, running the great business. We wanted you to manage it and see what's been wine I kept improving my, the wine and in 1949 we won four gold medals for the California State Fair. From 1947 to 1956, 
We won 121 medals and opened our own tasting room. Ian Laurie died in 1969 and I became president of the wine room. But you boys gave me so much heartache. All you could see Then in 1962, you came back from chewing weekly and wineries and angrily told us to get crazy wine with that. Mama, I am like you. I work so hard. There's no second best. Our wines were simply not good enough. I found some investors to bought historical old Calum Vineyard in Oakville in 1962. It was better that you started your own winery. I told you to take a six month lease in peace, but you still had 20% ownership. I'm sorry I'll be clean for public and the court has decided you will not do it up. Yes, Mama, it was not how I wanted it to end. It. But in 1965, I had Cliff May to design the winery, and in 66, we opened. At age 53, I had my own vineyards and brands. I'm so glad I got to see your success. You worked long days, and it was hard on your wife and kids. Work was everything for me, but I should have been a better family man. But Mama, in 1968, I crossed 500 tons of grapes. I wanted to expand, so I had to bring in Rainer Brewing Company to buy out my investors. The next year, I bought 250 more acres to cattle. The experience of growing vintage is overwhelming. It was a time of great expansion in new wineries. The whole lawsuit was so difficult, but we finally settled our differences. I finally bought out Rainer Brewing and gained complete control of my business. The gasoline shortage in the 70s cut our visiting numbers, but in, in 1979, I bought a winery in Lodi. We were able to afford a premium wine that we could sell alongside like, the discount jugs and box wines. So you did not pay enough attention to your family matters to your marriage ended? Yes, so sorry. Later, I saw a charming Swiss gal working in the winery. How I did not notice her before. She was in public relations. That was my dear Margaret. We married in 1980, then the dreaded phylloxera disease hit the vineyards. We all had, we had to be replanted and we had to borrow the jewels. Always expand your experimental marketing. We did not plan for a rainy day or a bad year. I measured my success, not by profits, but by quality of my wines and respect for my family. Has earned. At last, I had to share. I had to sell shares in 1993 and do it all over again. If I had to do it all over again, we would not go public. I took a gamble. That is the difference between epic careers and you at your own winery. We were cautious seniors, and after all, I joined this all over the world. Finally, I could not hear board meetings anymore. I had to quit my own company. Then my son Michael left too. The economy was bad, so in 2004, the directors sold to Constellation Brand. I'm so glad that you and Peter reunited to create the wines Austrian Navarro in 2005. Grapes from your vineyard and our vineyard made into one wine. Now that is a perfect map of our own and for story. Uh, Antonio, what a wonderful life you lived, both here in St. Helena and in, and in Italy. Yes, I remember it like it was yesterday. At age 16, I left my home and family in Lombardy, Italy and sailed to Canada. When I finally made it to California, I started working in the vineyards and soon started farming with two friends in Napa. After 10 years in America, you went back to the old country to visit your parents. And that's where I met you, Marina Tassetti, and we married in 1886. After the wedding, we left Italy, returned to St. Helena, and bought the Europa Hotel on Spring Street with our partner, Mr. Vasconi. Our three children started coming right, right away, every three years, Josie, Arthur, and Inez. All three are buried here with us. Sadly, the hotel burned to the ground just a few years after our son Arthur was born. But maybe the hotel fire was a blessing in disguise because it spurred you to get into the wine business. And I'm not trying to brag, but I was pretty good at the wine business. Oh yes you were, Antonio. In 1895, you leased a winery and 10 acres of land on Tyska Hill. Three years later, we bought the property and began building a new stone winery, a foreman's residence, and put in an olive grove. That winery was a beauty. I built, I built it out of hand-hewn stone from Glass Mountain. I produced mainly red wine and only used the highest quality grapes. Thank goodness you brought your cousin Charles Forney from Italy to live on the winery property and manage the vineyard. Well, family is important. When the children were young, you began building our new house, a Grand Queen and Victorian on the corner of Oak Avenue and Madrone. I built it, out of, I built it on a stone foundation and I used Italian marble for the steps up to the veranda. Our house was so comfortable with walls of redwood and all 11 rooms out with gas heating and electric lighting. Today our house stands on the Napa County Historic Resource List. We were happy in that house. I was pleased to bring my mother from Italy to live with us. She lived with, she lived with us there for nearly 20 years. She rests here in our family plot. Tell me again about your wine marketing innovations, Antonio. Well, I heard that there were many Italian immigrants that had come to the U.S. where they earned enough money working in granite and marble quarries, where they earned enough money to afford good Italian-style wine. Soon, I was shipping my wine 
Vermont, and major cities on the East Coast where there were many Italian immigrants. We so enjoyed our life in St. Helena, and you were part of many civic organizations like the Druids and the Opera Society, and you somehow found time to serve twice on the St. Helena Board of Trustees. Well, I believed in doing what I could in respecting the old country's food, wine, and music, and doing what I could for the town of St. Helena. Our family was so saddened by your death in 1908 at the young age of 49, and then I lost our sweet daughter Josie one year later from tuberculosis at the tender age of 21. And then I lost his son Arthur at age 37. Arthur's death was a blow to me because he took over the winery business with his uncle Charles and cousin Emil after your death. I understand your losses were great, Marana, but I understand that you had no choice but to sell Lombarda Cellars in 1933. But my beautiful stone winery still stands and it's, and it's used to make wine for Fremark Abbey. Thank you for joining Liberates and I on this happy day. This is a celebration of our marriage, as well as our prosperous new lives in the Napa Valley. You're right, Batista. Leaving our old life and starting new has been difficult, but we couldn't remain in the old country. Everyone in our whole village is poor. My family has chestnut trees, and we will gather in the fall to harvest chestnuts. Our harsh couple farm consisted of a few ragged goats, chickens, and sheep. In the summer, we produced vegetables, but it was never enough to sustain our large family. My family is poorer than yours. We had two girls and six boys. The girls married early and left. And they didn't take six boys to tend to some leisurely crops and bony cows. The men in my family were short. <laughs> we were extra as chimney sweeps. It was hot, dirty work. Each night we come home covered in soot, trying to scratch out a living. Me and my brother became skilled stonemasons. But even then, there wasn't enough work. Not enough chimneys in Catano to make a living. My brothers and I left Ticino for St. Helena. But I was afraid to leave home. I couldn't bear the thought of never seeing my sweet mama again. Papa believed that the Sino Cansi's rough, rocky terrain meant that the grapes in our vineyard had to work harder, and that's what distinguished our good wine. My brothers and I took our chestnuts to Geneva and Zurich and roasted them on street corners, serving them in newspaper cones. People couldn't understand our regional dialect, and nobody would buy them. Our vineyard produced such good grapes. Each year's vintage was better than that of the previous one. We would always sell out, but it was never enough to sustain our big family. Our stories are so similar, my friends. When me and my brother Guido finally decided to leave, we boarded a crowded steamship. We, had, um, I still don't know how Papa scrapped together enough money to buy our tickets. We kept hearing about opportunities in California. The rolling hills and sweeping ocean view sounded a lot better than crawling through chimneys all day. When me and my brother Guido finally left, uh, aboarded the crowded ship, we had nothing but the clothes on our back food all the time. Guido was seasick the whole trip. <laughs> well, we all miss our homelands and the families we left behind. There are many more opportunities here in the Napa Valley. Yes, Liberito and I are looking forward to our new lives with lots of kids. I have just been on a project to build a bridge across York Creek. I see more bridges in the future as our town continues to grow and prosper. <laughs> came to the Napa Valley in 1882. I bought land on Crystal Springs Road next to other Swiss Italians. You bought land from the Cenis in 1886. These neighbors embraced us and told me this new country, our home. We got married in 1891. They say America is a land of opportunity, but it's meant a lot of back-breaking work. Europeans like us brought skills to our new homeland. For us, it was growing grapes and making wine. We built our stone winery ourselves. We made it out of stone and redwood, bonded winery number 935. This is our job, to make good wine and support our four boys. It has also been a way to stay connected to our Swiss homeland. I did all the work of crushing the grapes, making the wine, blending it, and storing it in barrels. Customers would come to our winery with their own bottles and fill them directly from our barrels. We also built our stone winery ourselves. I made it out of stone and redwood. We made our own wine from the grapes that we grew in Napa Valley. Um, we continue to plant more vines and improve the quality of our wine. We're learning about more irrigation, soil, sunlight, and better pruning techniques. We learned which grapes thrive here. We wanted to make the best wine in the Napa Valley. Immigrants from Germany, France, and Italy continue to arrive in the Napa Valley. Just like the Berner family, Gustav Neobaum, and Shy Brothers. They're all growing grapes and making good wine too. We welcome their competition. It challenges us to learn more, work harder, and try new things.
People from San Francisco and as far as Monterey continue to arrive visit the Napa Valley Ju um, and buy our wine. It's become very popular throughout the area. This year's harvest may turn out to be our best vintage yet. Vintage yet. Long sunny days and cool nights have created perfect growing conditions. Our family continues to hone our craft. We believe we're elevating winemaking to an artisanal level. None of this would have been possible in Canton Ticino. <laughs> And we also have a play, The Murder on the Orient Express, opening October 20th, so I have to plug that. The postcards are at the table on your way out. Only four yeah. performances. Yeah, on the entrance table you'll see the um, little postcards so you can pick up one. And that concludes our tour for today, so thank you so much for coming.